Good afternoon. I don't have to tell all the people to be quiet and remember because there are just a few of us in the room, but I, many of us are remotely listening to us. And um, in fact, before I welcome you all in person and remotely um, to the Sunshin Seminar, I'd like us to stand for a moment together with our brave uh, Ukrainian brothers and sisters who are being brutalized by Putin and the Russian army simply because they are Uk Ukrainians. Thank you. It is especially joyful to introduce you today a new dynamic figure in our cultural world, Kathy Jonas Johnson Bowles, known casually as Johnson, has come to preside over one of our area's most treasured cultural institutions, the Everhart Museum. I believe that it's the only museum between Allentown and Binghamton, so it serves, I think that's true, <laughs> so it services a significant space of northeastern Pennsylvania and southern New York State. Johnson is both a scholar and a leader. She brings her scholarship and leadership skills to us. She's come to the Everhart with appreciation for what it is, architecturally, historically, and artistically. It's a treasure, as, it is, as is its location, Neog Park, designed by the nationally revered Fre Frederick Law Olmsted. Johnson brings to this treasure of our savvy, this experience and enthusiasm of a seasoned leader. She oversees all functions of the institution, including administration, finance, exhibitions, education, and visitor services. It is my hope to have her lead a tour of the museum for the Schemmel Forum in the near future. Please welcome her to the podium. Sure. Well, thank you so much. It's really an honor and pleasure to be with you today. Um, I have to say it's almost my one year anniversary of living here. And I'm proud to say that I can I can see my apartment building from here. So I'm, I'm fully invested in Scranton. And I have to say how much I love it here. I love the people. I love what's going on and what we can all accomplish together as we move forward in the next decade. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my point of view as we get started and what this is all about, because it might be a little bit different. Um, I'm an artist by training. And I was in academia for most of my career, 30 years. Um, I was a faculty member and I taught uh, drawing and art history and sculpture and mixed media arts. And I was also a museum director, a department chair, and then I went on to administration. Um, so when we look at what I'm going to be talking about, you know, think of it from uh, my point of view, which is uh, definitely from the arts and art history, but then it's also about culture and how we understand things. And then of course, the scientific point of view, and meaning that the classifications that we use to organize things in the world, like museums and libraries, um, and even things like people and plants and animals and minerals. Like how do we organize our world and what does that mean? So today I'm going to speak about Linnaeus, Carl Linnaeus and his legacy. And then I'm also going to talk about the nature of color. And this is kind of going to be a, 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 a jump for us when we talk about color not being uh, a pigment you know, that we, we paint with, or refraction of light, you know, the, the optics, or even um, symbolism. So this, this, um, this talk is based upon a, an essay that I wrote called The Color of Trauma. And it was published by After Image, uh, Journal of Media Arts and Cultural Criticism uh, last June. 
So I want to begin with this image. This is a Prussian blue in cinnabar as colors. And it's kind of jarring to look at, right? It, it vibrates off the page. It's kind of hard to look at. And this is where the idea came from to do this talk and my paper. I had a friend who looked at one of my artworks and said, I, that hurts my eyes. I can't even look at that. And I was thinking, well, yeah, that's just precisely what I'm trying to do here is that my artwork was about trauma and pain. And so the colors that could do that made a lot of sense to me. So after she said that, I started on this journey to uh, talk about how color can be painful or how that we understand what is the color of trauma. And I suppose it was kind of like falling down the rabbit hole, like everything started to come to mind about what that meant. I thought about how pigments and color could be dangerous, like Sheely's green, which is actually the, the color that has arsenic in it that Napoleon died from. So when he was in his bath and all the walls were painted uh, in that, that, with that pigment, it actually, he ingested it. And that's how he was poisoned. So that's kind of interesting that a color can kill you. Uh, orpiment and cinnabar, those are also toxic. Even the color chrome, chrome yellow and chrome orange that was used to paint the original school buses, that, that color that we, we use today that's supposed to make us stop and pay attention, that original color was actually toxic and could kill you, which is kind of ironic and horrible at the same time. And then I thought about how color can take over the body in the form of jaundice. And your body turns, turns a yellowish hue and that, that tells you there's something wrong. Or with cyanosis, how, how when there's this, uh, the flow and the circulation of your blood isn't working properly, you can appear blue, like cyan, the color blue. And also how we use grotesque metaphors to name colors and products, even like crayons called atomic tangerine, frostbite, and mummy brown. Those are all actual names of crayon, crayons and colors. And then how we color code race and identity and how that has become uh, oppressive and violent. So I'm here to take you uh, along a journey about color and how it affects our world and how we look at it. And it's a path littered with pain and suffering. Although I'll spare you the parts about color and disease only because you're eating and, and it's, not really, uh, it's not really lunch talk and lunch imagery. But I will tell you there's a couple of images towards the end that, that may be triggering and not quite something you want to be eating during. So, so just uh, eat up and we'll get there. So I share this picture with you because we often talk about psychologists and folklorists and uh, how physicists look at color. And that we think about emotional touchstones, symbolic equivalents for cultural practice, light and optics and um, perception. So I show you my cat, Edie, and her uh, personality here. But the background of, of yellow, we often think of happiness and sunshine. And then when we think of red roses, we think of love and Valentine's Day. And when we think of the color black, we associate with death and sadness and grief. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to dig deeper into negative aspects of color and how it can be a weapon that's been used to, for insidious, morally corrupt purposes. So I want to take you on this journey about how I, how I came to this and how I, I thought about it. So the first thing, you know, as artists, we're often taught is color theory and as we use it in design. And one of the most important people scientifically uh, for getting us to think about color differently and how it interacts is certainly Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton composed seven hues via the, uh, the process of diffraction. And Newton's rainbow, or Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, are the basis of how we understand diffraction of light and how it breaks apart. 
And what's interesting about Newton and what he talked about in his treatise was towards the end, he would often talk about that light and color is a body. Well, that's where you have to have this leap with me is that how can color be a body like us? And then how can this body have behaviors? How can color do things and act? So now Goethe, kind of following on the steps of Newton, also talked about the theory of colors. And he was challenging some of Newton's theories, and he called for a deeper consideration of the phenomenal, phenomenological aspects of color. He believed that color is a conscious body capable of possessing and evoking an emotional response. He believed color was subjective and it varied for every viewer. He believed that color acts as a being with other beings, concretely in space. Not just an intangible phenomenon of light that can be explained mathematically. All right, so Goethe, it, uh, the scientific community was like, yeah, some of your ideas are flawed, you know. You're just too out there and we don't really get it. But anyhow, but his concepts really captured the minds of artists and philosophers. And in fact, in 1840, Charles Locke Eastlake translated Goethe's treatise. And he actually added his own notes that he thought would be of interest to painters. He talked about complementary color. So basically complementary color on the color wheel are the opposites. <clears throat> harmony, color harmony, contrast, and gradation. And the painter that kind of embraced that in the most spectacular way and thought about that was Turner. And what Turner does is important when we think about the nature of color as a body, but also how he completely changed the direction of art. He made color the subject, as if color was a portrait, a still life, a landscape, or historical event. Yes, this is a historical event he's depicting, but the subject matter is really color. Color for him wasn't just a way to uh, colorize a three-dimensional object in space. You know, we think about um, black and white photographs and people colorizing them. Well, that's really before all this took place with Turner and others, people just saw color as a way of colorizing something like the local color of something. So a tree is green, the sky is blue, right? An apple is red. That's really the object's local color. But that's not talking about how the color interacts and how we see it and how, we, how it feels to look at it. So you want to think sort of about Monet and what he was doing too later. Color for him was also not symbolic. It wasn't like yellow is about happiness. He thought that that was all nonsense. But color was a body, a force, a personality capable of exuding its own unique physicality and determinism. The emotional qualities of color are situational and not static, and that color is capable of destruction and death. And Turner's work visualizing the traumatic forces of nature through color created a revolutionary path towards modernism. And in fact, when we think of Seurat and pointillism, Actually, that's about color being bodies. So we have one color and another color. And as they exist in space, and forgive the term, but they kind of procreate visually. They create another color. And that's what we see when the colors are next to each other. So the color is pushed and pulled through space and, and, and gives birth to another color. And that's the idea that colors can be bodies. And then certainly in modernism, this is taken even farther. This work by Helen Frankenthaler, it's about the color as a body and it's raw and brutal, um, brutal and it moves through space. 
And she actually talked about that, that color had the capacity to express action and reaction. And she said, I think of my pictures as explosive landscapes, worlds and distances held on a flat surface. For Frankenthaler, color is a being that occupies space and interacts in time. Color is a physical presence. Now, Joseph Albers is thought to be one of the most important uh, color theorists of the last century. In his seminal work, The Interaction of Color, he attests that color is a living physical being with a full spectrum of personalities and the ability to act evenly, even malevolently to induce trauma. Albers casts the color as processing, possessing individual identities with personalities. He instructed his students, try to find those colors which are more inclined to exert influence to distinguish them from those which will accept influence. When describing this image, he notes, brown and violet grounds, the center square looks like the grounds exchanged violet and brown, but they are the same color, precisely alike, and at the same time refer to neighboring grounds. The true color of the two central squares therefore becomes unrecognizable and loses its identity. Albers changes the definition of color from an inanimate object, a thing, to a being with an identity. In Albert, uh, Albert's introduction to the book, he calls the introduction, a color has many faces, and perhaps re relates it to the three faces of Eve of 1957, the film and both the book. The, the story, it is a true story, a true account of a woman with dissociative identity disorder. Her pe personalities are named Eve White, <clears throat> Eve Black, and Jane. The story chronicles the dominance and submission of Eve Black and Eve White until Jane emerged as Black and White's ultimate melding. The dualism of White and Black and association with good and bad made me wonder about colors in the same way, such as white, black, red, and yellow, and how they came to be associated with race and racism. So if we're all humans and there's why is there a tension of dominance and submission and why is it manifested in color? And where did that concept come from? Well, I'm gonna tell you, this fellow, Carl Linnaeus, who's Swedish, he lived from 1707 to 1778 and he was the mo a father of modern taxonomy, but he was also the originator of scientific racism. So, Linnaeus, of course, first classified plants and animals, then classified um, also minerals. And one of the most, he was the most acclaimed for his, his book here. This is the 10th edition. And even Goethe said, with the exception of Shakespeare and Spinoza, I know no one among the no longer living who has influenced me more strongly. And he first assigned, Linnaeus first assigned uh, a taxonomy to the human species, Homo sapiens. And he presented man as animal, which was pretty problematic for the time period about, well, you know, if we're made uh, in the image of God, this is through Christianity I'm speaking, then how can we, how can we also be an animal? So that was kind of... <coughs> a game changer, but he recognized what he called four varieties. At that point, he did not call them races. He did not call them species, but the four varieties he based were upon geography, which were the four known continents at the time and color, which he thought as a product of climate. And they were Homo sapien Americanus, which he classified as red, the color red, Homo sapien Europe, uh, Europeanus, I'm, I'm 
my Latin isn't very good. My uh, my ex husband was a, a botanist, and I tried. I tried. Maybe that's not why we're together, because I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't do the Latin. Um, no, just kidding. There's many other things. Um, and then uh, Homo sapiens asiaticus, tawny, and Homo sapiens africanus, or black. Now he he revised his theories in this book 12 times, but it wasn't until the 10th that it changed so radically as to create uh, scientific racism. So, and this was published in 1758. And this is when he added the physical and moral attributes of the varieties. For each, he added skin, medical temperament, body posture, Two, physical traits, including hair color, form, eye color, and facial traits. Three, behavior. Four, clothing. And five, type of government. So he also changed hierarchy. Often uh, it kind of changed in terms of which one was first, second, and third, and fourth. And in this, it remained that Americanus or Native American peoples were first, Europeans were second, Asian third, African fourth. Now, African never changed, but some of the some of the ones in between did. He also changed instead of tawny as the color related to Asian people, he actually changed it to luridus, which is means yellow, but it also can mean sickly and toxic when it's applied to plants. So that's kind of an interesting thing that he did there. Um, I'm not going to show you um, a chart of the words that he used because they are so offensive and some people still use them today to talk about different races. But if you would like to look at them and uh, investigate, you can look at the Linnaean Society of Great Britain. And they are fully transparent about who Linnaeus was and how scientific racism occurred. So if you'd like to look there, but I think you can well imagine without me kind of highlighting them in this way. Okay. So from Linnaeus, then there was this fellow named Blumenbach. And Blumenbach took Linnaeus's idea even a step farther. He created five races of mankind and, again, uh, ascribed color, white, yellow, copper-colored, which is interesting that um, when they described Native American peoples, they called it copper colored and not red at this point, but uh, tawny, tawny black, pitchy black. <clears throat> and this is where it gets weird and, and, and horrible at the same time. This is, he deemed white as the most beautiful. And he, the Georgian people who lived in the Caucasus Mountains, the embodiment of that ideal. And he's the one that termed Caucas uh, Caucasian skin. And this is where he got it from. Uh, he uh, examined skulls and body parts. And there was a female skull given to him by uh, another fellow. And he deemed that skull this perfect specimen and the most beautiful he had ever examined. In a letter that accompanied that skull, he re was reported that the sc skull was from a young Georgian woman captured by the Russians during the Caucasian War, and she had died in Moscow, Moscow from venereal disease. This is the disembodiment of color. Color stands for everything, but there is no person, no name, no identity associated with Caucasian. Whoever she was, she is now invisible. She's a ghost, an afterimage, and she and the whole theory is going to haunt us for hundreds of years later. And a part of that haunting even happened in the United States, as you know. So President James Madison uh, had quite a paternalistic view of Native Americans. And so 
um, it is unclear really where the term red calling Native American peoples red comes from, and it is a slur. The only thing that I, I can determine, perhaps others who are in the, in the field would, would probably correct me if I was not, uh, didn't get this quite right, but he talked about their the clothing in that chart as painting themselves with the red lines. But it's unclear who really started to use that term um, but it does appear that it was translated and used uh, in the late 1700s. Uh, we, we do know it was common by the 1800s. In fact, the reason I list President Madison here is because he, it's documented that he used the term in a speech in 1812. Uh, he was quite paternalistic about it as well. And he believed that it was the federal government's duty to convert Native Americans by, and he uh, wanted to encourage uh, them to become farmers and adopt European style of agriculture to help them assimilate. Basically, this is the, the, the disappearance of identity and, and body, the, um, the disembodiment. In fact, uh, in 1819, the U.S. Congress passed the Civilization Fund Act, which encouraged Amer American education to be provided to indigenous societies and therefore enforced the civilization process. Uh, and this led to the federally funded American Native American boarding schools. And you may have seen the exhibition that the museum had about this. Um, they existed um, the boarding schools existed from 1860 until 1978, and it was a forced experience. And there were 357 boarding schools in 30 states um, and housed over 60,000 um, Native American children. The purpose was to erase identity and existence, to remove their color as seen in this um, image. That is the same person. Those aren't two different people. I'm gonna take, take that in for a minute. But not only identity was taken away, but life itself. Uh, I think you've probably seen in the, the, the news in the last couple of years where unmarked graves have been found, hundreds and hundreds of children found in graves, uh, undocumented. And in fact, after uh, so many graves were found in the U.S. and Canada. The U.S. announced in November of 2021 that the former sites of these schools would be searched. Racial slurs and epitaphs of violence have been used for more than 100 years uh, in, in the form of mascots. And only in 2020, after decades of activism and legal work by Native Americans and allies, did the Washington uh, and Cleveland football teams drop, the, drop their names that are associated with slurs. In fact, the, um, the National Congress of American Indians issued a report in 2013 uh, noting that more than 2,000 institutions with mascots relating to Native American people and culture. So the idea that there is a stereotype and it's disembodied and it's being wiped away is a really important issue for many artists, particularly John Quick to see Smith. This is one of her works called I See Red, Target of 1992. So Interestingly, if you can imagine, it's the first painting by a Native American artist to enter the National Gallery's art collection. And that was in 2020. She stated uh, in an interview about being, the work being acquired, because the popular myth-making, Native Americans are seen as vanished. It helps to assuage the government's guilt about an un undocumented genocide as well as stealing the whole community. She adds, it's like we don't exist except in the movies or as mascots for sport team, sports teams. Color in this case has been accomplice for the dehumanization and objectification of an entire race of people. 
And this is not unlike the word yellow, the slur yellow to describe Asian peoples. This is a work by Roger Shimamura, and he's lampooning this idea. But again, this can be traced back to Carl Linnaeus, who assigned Luridus to what he termed Homo sapiens Asiaticus as in his classification. It means lurid, sallow, pale yellow. And he also used the color to describe unhealthy as well as toxic plants. Yellow as a slur was also referenced by Will, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany in 1895, where he reflects Caucasian fears that Asian uh, countries would take over Western countries. And Yellow Peril became a campaign to demonize East Asian peoples and cultures. In the US, the Chinese Exclusion Act banned Chinese immigration from, are you ready? From 1882, to 1943. If you had come in to uh, the country legally, you were um, provided with an ID. And this is an example from a man from, I think he's from uh, Pittsburgh, yeah. During World War II, the U.S. incarcerated more than 100,000 Japanese Americans and East Asians have been stereotyped and demeaned in art, literature, and film, including Sachs Romer's novel, The Mystery of Dr. Fu Manchu of 1913. Even recently, Asian peoples have been demonized by, the government, by government officials and blamed for COVID-19. And even the slur is associated with, with that. Now, if we look on to another slur and color. This, this work that we're seeing here is by the renowned photographer Gordon Parks. And it represents too how Linnaeus and Bloombach's concepts of a hierarchical taxonomy reverted, rever, reverberate in the practice of slavery. Remember how I told you that the, the, the hierarchy that they developed, the horrific hierarchy had placed people of Africa at the bottom. So the, the term and the use of the terms have a haunt, continue to haunt us with Joe Crow, uh, Jim Crow laws of racial segregation well into the 20th century. And the, the, the hierarchy and the associated uh, demeanors that they perpetuated still again haunt us. And this photo essay, and this is a part of a photo essay that Gordon Parks uh, created for Life magazine. And what he wanted to do was to use color photography as if to remove the black and white lines of segregation. He wanted to talk about the inhumanity, the concreteness of lived experience and how it was visible and real and no longer in an abstract con concept of separate but equal. So you can see just even the, the use of the word on the entrance sign. And that word uh, was used by whites during this time period in American history as a slur. By the, 20th, the 21st century, that term would be um, transformed and reclaimed as people of color. And then you see that often that a word or a symbol, and we'll talk about another symbol that's been reclaimed. And the effects of Linnaeus's palette of trauma came to a head in 2020. An anger over systematic racism and violence toward people of color, including the murders of George Floyd and many, many others. Public monuments to Bloombach's uh, palette of malignancy were toppled. <coughs> Germany's Third Reich also used the concept of color coding and racism um, that um, Linnaeus and Blumenbach um, used. So it's terrible to think about. And, and sometimes I couldn't figure this out. I was like, why, why did they talk about the Aryan race as blonde and blue eyed? Well, if you look at Linnaeus's chart, 
That's how he talked about. But they also used color coding and concentration camps. There were charts, there were shapes that told you that those who had them were less than, they were other. And even the, the, the idea of a pink triangle, the pink uh, and upside, upside down triangle is often historically related to the feminine spirit. And that, they used that symbol to identify um, people uh, who are LGBTQ+. But what's interesting about the use of the pink triangle, it was reclaimed as a power symbol uh, during the AIDS crisis. And if you remember the posters from the 80s and the 90s, and it was a pink triangle, this is silence equals death. This is what they were referring to. So once one visualizes the palette, it appears everywhere trauma appears, like a pattern of criminal behavior is difficult to unsee and ignore. And when examining some of the most searing painful images of trauma in art and film history, the palette seems to reoccur. When I look at the history of art and in films, and when I think about uh, the nature of trauma, and then I applied the Pantone has an app where you can pick out the five most dominant colors. It's weird. They come up with that palette. Um, so I want us to think about that as the next section of my talk. And I want to begin by talking about regarding the pain of others by Susan Sontag. In her book, she, she talks about how one person's, how they see the world and how they prosper is at the expense sometimes of another, and that causes pain and suffering. So she said, our privileges are located in the same map as their suffering and may, in ways we prefer not to imagine, be linked to their suffering as the wealth of some imply the destitution of others. So how does this affect what we buy and what we sell? How do these colors and this system of color affect our economy and capitalism? Well, they come to us in grotesque metaphors, as I mentioned earlier. This is an actual crayon produced by Crayola called Atomic Tangerine. Think about that. Children are taught to name a light sherbet like peach color atomic tangerine without a second thought to its inspiration. The atomic bomb's mushroom cloud. And this bomb caused the horrific deaths of hundreds of thousands of people in Japan. The pain of others is exploited through color. There are also other colors associated with pain that, that Crayola uses. There's a bright neon green called Screaming Green. There's also a maroon colored crayon that's called Dingy Dungeon. And it's in Crayola's Silly Scent line of 2006. You still get this, seriously. Uh, and Crayola touts about about it. Silly scent markers, crayons and colored pencils contain fun smelling colors that offer multi sensory scent station. Okay, so creating a blood colored product named after a place where torture is inflicted is completely unconscionable. But it's done and most people don't even think about it. They also produced other colors like blizzard blue and a light lavender blue Crayola crayon is frostbite. More recently, Pantone rolled out period red <coughs> in 2020. That's what this was called and that's what you're thinking this is about is what it's about. 
The vice president of Pantone Color Institute described the color as an active, adventurous red hue, which I think is hilarious and just so wrong. Whoops. Sorry, this is not. on the wrong way. Okay, sorry about that. Kind of got too, too off on it. I saw there's something <clears throat> too irritated by it. Okay, so it was commissioned by a, a Swedish feminine care brand called Intimina and it was used to market a, a product for women. And the, the manager of it said, enough is enough, it's 2020. Isn't it time period stop being considered as a private affair or negative experience? Okay, so, so this person seeks to make individual pain and suffering a collective and positive experience for financial gain. Like, I don't know any women who talk about it as fun and adventurous and um, not a, necessarily a negative experience. So they are giving this promise of happiness under the guise of color and negating the reality of individual experience. So the premise of period red undermines the validity of women's experience and seems to gaslight the public into believing that the pain and suffering associated with menstruation is just a figment of imagination to be willed away by a positive hue. So this concept of the promise of happiness and color the Benetton Group also co-opted color and trauma in its controversial United Colors of Benetton campaigns in the 1980s and 90s. With a smarmy promise of happiness and racial har harmony via the purchase of clothing. This is one of their ads, and it's a photograph by Olivero Toscana, Toscani, and graphically depicts three disembodied hearts, the human, presumably, each separate, separately labeled white, black, and yellow. It is a perverse logic to use traumatized bodies and death to traumatize the viewer into seeing everyone is equal. <coughs> Manufacturing decisions have also uh, based, been based on implicit bias with regard to who possesses power and value in the marketplace or share of the market. Those deemed to, have, to be less productive in acquiring wealth have less impact in determining the manufacturer and availability of products. So this, this, is, uh, I, this is one of my um, favorite examples, favorite being most uh, pointed, not favorite like, oh, that's a good thing, it's not. Um, so with Kodak Film, I don't know if people know this, that originally Kodak Film was balanced to represent Caucasian skin. So it was just normally calibrated to be balanced to that its skin tone. And in fact, they also had what was known as a Shirley card. And apparently that was named for the person who was the first model. And she was just some somebody who worked uh, in one of the offices. And the Shirley card would tell you how to calibrate and make sure it printed correctly. So it was calibrated for Caucasian skin. And then you see the three, the, the red, blue, and yellow, and black, and white. They were also called China girls for their porcelain colored skin. But by the, 19, by the late 90s, they created the multi-racial Shirley card. But what you may not know, and as of my degree is in photography, I have an MFA, and I did um, some work kind of looking at this and seeing what would happen. And it's interesting that Fujifilm is actually balanced for more uh, of an Asian skin tone. 
So I'm sure that one of the, the, the rationale to kind of work on the multiracial Shirley card for Kodak was it was having competition in its presumption of who was buying uh, their product. And over the last 10 years, with increased public mm -hmm. pressure and the growing market share relative to what's been termed the browning of America, companies have made efforts to create products representative of a variety of skin tones. Pantone unveiled its skin tone guide of 110 colors for matching and reproducing skin tones and printing in 2012. And then um, on in 2020, Crayola, our favorite Crayola, released um, a product called Colors of the World Skin Tone Crayons. And they came in, they come in 24 and 32 packs. And then also in 2020, Band-Aid announced a new line of bandages that curiously includes five colors. Looks like Bluma Max colors to me, but, and then uh, donated money to Black Lives Matter to help fight racism and justice in America. So in conclusion, I guess what I want to say that I don't think we, we learn and listen and understand uh, um, the points of view and we don't investigate our own biases as much as we should. And there's many clues and there's origins for nearly everything. And someone has come up with these ideas about color and body and importance that we all need to um, understand better. So thank you for listening. use the mic so people can hear it at home. I just have a comment on your last offering about the band-aids. I was just in local yarn stores yeah. and they're now offering yarns, calling them skin tone yarns mm -hmm. in various colors up to maybe eight to ten different tones for this for the skin. I don't know. Uh, it made me feel a little creepy at first. Really? No, it just uh, like they hadn't done it before. They hadn't. They had never done it before. That's what says why suddenly you are enlightened. Yeah, because people got mad, and with good reason. And finally, things came to a head, and we, I think, people. Were, oh, sorry. And people were ready to hear it. You know, uh, it, it's a terrible tragedy that things have gone on this long, and but continue. I mean, we're still fighting these things, right? We see it every day in the news. So. Oh. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, the first part of the talk reminded me of something that I had seen uh, way back in 1969 or 70. Uh, USIS, United States Information Service, used to send out reels. And I was... I didn't hear that last part. It, it used to send out these uh, newsreels mm -hmm. throughout the world. And, and I was in, a, in my school in India. We used to get these reels. So we saw Armstrong landing on the moon and all that. But the one that I remember most is uh, Lady Bird Johnson, whose passion was uh, planting wildflowers in the, in the middle of Texas highways, right. took along a group of children who were blind and how she explained the colors to them. It, it was beautiful. Uh, she says, you know, blue is like an ice water on your skin. Mm -hmm. Yellow is like sunlight. Uh, it's beautiful. And I remember that when you were talking. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I'll send you a link to that if I can find it. I know I had it. And the other part was recently, there was a talk of emojis. I think NPR carried this. And it's interesting because I never really, up until then, uh, saw the images as, you know, they're color coded. And I never did that consciously. But my two children always followed that. And, uh, you know, it was interesting how 
how that has affected how people message in terms of the emojis they use. Just my comment. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. It's been very, oh. very interesting. Thank you. If you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, stay back. That's one of the slurs that I heard growing up. And there are things, I love some of the things you said, but uh, certainly the observation that so much of this still goes on. Um, we don't hear so much slurs of other ethnic groups, and you all know they exist. You know some of those words. But I wish, uh, one of the things that I think could change some things immediately is in the media. If you're watching TV, you see dark-skinned people, and mostly you see eyes and teeth. And that is because the lighting hasn't been addressed. And why haven't we addressed it? Uh, with all the dark skin, you know, stars that we've had, et cetera, et cetera. That's one thing um, I uh, look at. You do see eyes and teeth, and it, and it is very scary, uh, scary. And we should look at geography, too. Uh, centuries of, of uh, living, uh, generation after generation, growing under the hot sun, all of that. Looking where the sun is very slight, why wouldn't people uh, be different? Of course, I'm speaking from uh, the evidence of a, of a uh, person of color, but I grew up with little black sambo. It's the same thing. Oh, yes, yeah, terrible. Exaggerated terribly. But if yeah, I grew up in the closer, South, too. Yes, and if we take a closer look at uh, black people, black people are not black. When the ships came over and all that, uh, there was the hair was tiny, rolled up, uh, whatever pieces, um, and a very oily skin. Again, because of the uh, geography, we don't look at that. And I think we could uh, change so much of that with just a couple things: um, stressing geography and stressing uh, lighting. And I grew up in the days of Linnaeus, not in his days taught in school at the same time. So those are just a couple of observations, but thank you for what you brought to light. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your comments. You know, some of the things you're talking about, I, you know, I grew up with too. And as, you know, I, I get really bent out of shape when, when the lighting isn't correct and I can't see someone's face. It, it seems insulting to the person uh, to not adjust those things and not th think of the the spectrum and understanding how the light works. We have the technology. Why can't we do that? Um, so we have a lot, a lot to do. Um, well, how, how much does this um, research in this field what kind of impact might it have in um, uh, understanding our world better? Um, well, there are several fields, and I didn't really get into it. There's several fields of uh, uh, several. The discipline of philosophy is looking at and talking a lot about new materialism and talking about how to stop uh, thinking of the world in dualisms, you know, is good or bad, white or black, and thinking of life and how we look at the world in a continuum and how that could be a much more positive way philosophically to go about things that, you know, someone's, uh, another example would be someone's not just straight or gay, that there is this continuum of identity and so I think that, that um, these disciplines that are emerging or are, are schools of thought can also help us reimagine because a lot of this is, is based on some image in your head, you know, that's been embedded there since you were a child about thinking about the world. And so I, I think that, that those things are, are helpful. Um, I think about um, even the... Economists thinking about 
products and how we look at them. Your know, economy has to has to change. Um, so many things could be, and I think it's not just about one discipline that can affect things, but it's uh, it's all the disciplines who can look at. We always talk about in higher ed. Uh, about um, having a chief diversity officer um, and having an office of diversity. But really, it's everyone's job. And you can apply the ideas of diversity, equity, inclusion, no matter where you are, you can apply it to data management, right? Because a lot of uh, databases don't take diacritical um, uh, marks, they also have, you know, Mr. or Ms or miss, right? So it's every discipline that can be affected by this idea, these ideas of, of mm -hmm. taking away uh, <clears throat> dualisms that might be more positive. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your, um, your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure you'll bring your background with you now that you're at the museum here in Scranton. Do you have any sense so far how you might anticipate changing things as we look to the future at the museum? Is that going to affect your work? Yeah, I think about that a lot. We have these interesting conversations about labels. You know, how do we present information? You know, the didactic uh, labels that are next to the piece uh, and uh, what we call the didactics, which is an explanation, but then the, what we call the tombstone label and how do we present information there that kind of sometimes can reinforce these things? Even the categorization, I was noticing, sorry, I was noticing in, um, you know, we've been around for 113 years. So, you know, there's a lot of things that um, need to be updated um, rightfully. And it's not from lack of interest or want, it's just time. But I noticed that Sometimes our African art labels might say simply African maker instead of breaking down that this piece has an, a linguistic name that's associated with it. It has a people's, you know, a society that may have created it. And then within that, there may be a cultural part of it and then a geographic location. Right. But sometimes in museums that are old like ours, uh, the past conventions still are in the system, so to speak. So one thing that I think about as I change and uh, change labels and do research is to make sure that I'm as specific as possible in identifying the maker. I'll give you another example. Um, we have this lovely um, headdress. Um, from Oklahoma. And, you know, I, I was thinking about, well, what, you know, how can I put this out on view? I don't know much about it. And I found in the files, oh gosh, from the 1940s, the original letter that came with it. And it, and it said the name of the person who made it. And that had never been put in the records. The name of the person who made the headdress Fighting Bull was the, the Americanized English name of the of the person that had been lost all the all this time. And I was like, I'm going to put this on the label. And then I researched in the genealogical records of the town, and I found when he was when he, they believe he was born. And so, as a part of what I want to do, is make sure to the extent I possibly can is to make sure that we know something about who made it and to do it in the, with the best practices of, um, and respect that we can possibly do. Now, it's a lot of work. There's labels up there that I have to still change, so don't expect to go in there and find it all magically transformed. But I guarantee you that anything new that, that we put out is going to make a greater effort to name. Another just smaller example is the convention of naming uh, or identifying women by their husband's name, full name. So we've had things that say, Mrs. John Law Robertson. 
And I had to go back through, and thanks to Lackawanna County's online system, I had to go through the uh, her last will and testament to find her real name, Retta Church Robertson. And I can guarantee you that Retta Church Robert Robertson will be listed on the label to identify who she was. So just a few examples. Yes, Ron. You mentioned the Washington football team, mm -hmm. the Washington Redskins becoming, having a new name, and you said the Cleveland football team, but it was really the Cleveland baseball team. I mean, sorry, I meant to say baseball. Cle Cleveland Indians. I actually know the difference, yes. Yes. So I'm trying to decide. Is I that, apologize. Is Thank that a you. good thing, or is it so sad that it's taken all this time for this to happen? Is it right? progress, or is it just terrible that it's taken so long? Yeah, it's kind of terrible that it's taken this long. I mean, we we know better. You know, as a human beings, we we know better. People are still fighting it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say that this is, as you all know, I think this is a Women's History Month, mm -hmm. and our uh, public station WBIA does a great job with pointing out uh, what women have done, including those that have been kept down and uh, more uh, talented than. Their brothers, and we're not allowed to, you know, what I'm talking about. We're not allowed to present their music at all. But WBIA is a great place for history. They do their homework. Yeah, I love them. They do a great job. I just have a comment um, with what you had said earlier. Uh, I have a collection of Christmas cards that my mother sent out when I was a child, and she just wrote on it Charlie's. There's no, nobody else's name, just my father's name for the whole family, Charlie's. Wow. That's it. Yeah. What's her name? Oh, my, my mother's name was Sarah. Sarah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Charlie and Sarah from now on. We'll think of it that way. Well, thank you for this opportunity. At the mic, so everyone can hear. We have a lot of people. Listening oh, sorry. Yes, of course. Who are not uh, Sandra? We're not with us uh, in this room, but we're listening remotely. And to all of you, um, well, let's thank let's thank this wonderful scholar and 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 a, a new a new member of our uh, important member of our cultural community and i um as i said uh, earlier um i'm hoping that we can shemmel forum can be invited to have a tour of the everhart museum with the leader don't okay okay well thank you, thank you and don't forget uh, we're uh, on Next week is what's our next? 14th. Oh, the fourteenth. Oh, I should remember that one yeah. because uh, my son and daughter-in-law will be speaking <laughs> <laughs> about a um, a um, a town, a very unusual town in northern New York that is was created by and run by a group of um, very orthodox Jewish people, and. Um, David has been doing research on this for about 15 years. So you may hear more than you want to know about it, but please don't forget to come. Yes, and those of you who are not here in person today, I hope more of you will come too because I miss seeing you. Thank you.